Now, another giant uh, of this story is a gentleman whose name is Stanley Miller. Now, Stan was a businessman from Harrisburg that owned Miller's Auto Supply, um, uh, which is located on, had been located on Third Street, where the Midtown Scholar is right now across from the Harrisburg Market. Stan uh, served as Schaefer's campaign treasurer and then allowed uh, campaign staff to use the Miller Auto Supply you know, warehouse as part of their campaign activities. And Stan was a really good man, very well respected uh, you know, within the Harrisburg Jewish community. And later, Stan and his wife became very good friends and then Stan served for many years as a Keystone board member. Now Schaefer asked Stan Miller to join his cabinet as and serve as the secretary of the Department of Public Wal Welfare. Now Stan had absolutely no experience in welfare or human services, but he said yes nonetheless. So Stan determined that he would go visit the state institutions that he was now responsible for. And he went out and he was stunned to realize that there were thousands of people living in these institutions that were now under you know, his supervision. He encountered the bedrooms with hundreds of people, the day rooms of people, of 100 people milling around with nothing to do. People, children and adults would come up to touch him and hug and it was really clear you know, of how uh, the great need that people had for human contact. Um, the conditions of filth were just absolutely appalling. They could cause any visitor to gag. Um, Stan was just stunned and devastated by what he saw. He literally had, had no expectation. He returned to his office at the Department of Public Welfare here in Harrisburg and immediately went into Dr. Adelstein's office and started to tell him um, about all that you know, he saw and experienced. Um, while telling about the issues that he'd been witness to, he started to cry. And um, when he recovered his composure, he said, Stan, this is wrong. We've got to do something. Or he said, Joe, this is wrong. We've got to do something. Those 10 words, Joe, this is wrong, that we've got to do something, ended up being transformative. Joe went over to his desk, opened his drawer, pulled out a sheaf of papers, and handed them to Stan and said, Stan, this is what we're going to do. And that sheaf of papers was the uh, Mental Health and Intellectual Disability Act of 1966. Together, Stan and Joe created a very powerful partnership that really began to move implementation of the act forward in uh, very significant ways. So what led us to this act of 1966? What were the circumstances that brought Joe to be the architect of legislation that would become the foundation of our services today and would transform the lives of tens of thousands of people? To answer this question, we have to touch the life of Rosemary Kennedy. Now, Rosemary Kennedy, wrong way, um, was born in her parents' home in Brookline, Massachusetts in 1918. She was the third child and first daughter of Joseph and uh, Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy. Uh, during her birth, there was a, uh, a harmful restriction on oxygen that resulted in a mild intellectual disability. And um, Rose Kennedy, Rosemary's mother, um, did not share or disclose that disability to anybody other than a few close family members and uh, somewhat pretended that uh, her daughter was normal. During a, an interview for Women's Day, uh, she talked about uh, Rose uh, being a, uh, a teacher and having aspirations of being on the stage. Now, diaries reveal that, that Rose was a young woman whose life was really filled with outings and opera and tea parties and dress fittings. You know, she had the opportunity to meet Queen Elizabeth and uh, President Roosevelt. One Kennedy biographer described Rosemary as being absolutely beautiful with a gorgeous smile. At 20, she was a picturesque young woman, a snow princess, with flushed cheeks, gleaming smile, and sweetly ingratiating manner to almost everyone that she met. Now in 1941, uh, Rosemary Kennedy was 23 years old and doctors told Joseph Kennedy, her husband, her, her father, that uh, there was a new uh, 
a psychosurgical procedure that would cure some of the outbursts uh, that she was experiencing. Uh, and this new procedure was a lobotomy. And uh, Joe Kennedy decided that you know, his daughter you know, should have the lobotomy performed. However, he did not consult uh, his wife or any other family members before uh, authorizing the procedure. Now, Dr. Watts detailed the medical record, describes what happened. He says, we went through the top of her head. She was awake. She had a mild tranquilizer. I made a surgical incision in the brain through the skull. It was near the front of both sides. We just made a small incision, no more than an inch. The instrument Dr. Watts used looked like a butter knife. He swung it up and down to cut brain tissue. As Dr. Watts cut, Dr. Freeman asked Rosemary to recite the Lord's Prayer, sing God bless America, or count backwards. And we made an estimate of how far to cut based on how she responded. When she began to become incoherent, we stopped. Well, after Rosemary's lobotomy, it immediately became um, uh, obvious of what a, a catastrophic you know, event the surgery had been. She lost her ability to talk, uh, to walk, and was probably functioning at the level of a two-year-old. Uh, she was immediately institutionalized in a series of private institutions, and then in 1941 was relocated to uh, Jefferson, Wisconsin, where she lived for the rest of her life on the grounds of St. Collette School for uh, Exceptional Children. Now, in November of 1960, her brother, JFK, uh, was elected president of the United, 35th president of the United States. Uh, while campaigning for presidency in Wisconsin, he decided to visit his sister, Rosemary, and it was the first that he had seen her in almost two decades. Um, he was stunned was the first time that he learned uh, the truth about the lobotomy and the, the impact that it had on his sister, and shared that uh, with his other sister of Eunice, who had been very close to Rosemary as they were growing up as uh, young girls and young women. Uh, as a result of that, Eunice became an incredibly powerful advocate for people with mental illness and with intellectual disability. Uh, and when Kennedy was elected president, she pushed him really, really hard to make this one of uh, his top priority uh, issues as president. And in response to Eunice's advocacy, uh, JFK commissioned the President's Panel on Mental Health and Intellectual Disability. It was a panel of 26 really top medical and social and educational leaders from the United States. It was chaired by uh, Dr. Mayo at the Mayo Institute, and then also co-chaired by uh, Dr. Elizabeth Boggs, who was the actual functional chair of the commission. Uh, now, Elizabeth Boggs was very much involved in the, uh, the family movement and the national arc, and uh, actually was, 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 was frequently involved in the early days uh, here in Pennsylvania. Uh, the commission worked for one year and came up with 112 recommendations. President Kennedy took those 112 recommendations and translated them into a message to uh, Congress on February 5th of 1963. And I really encourage people to read uh, this message. It's very accessible on the internet. And it is a fabulous vision that is relevant today uh, in terms of um, you know, what he envisioned and what the commission envisioned uh, as the, the, the changes necessary for this area. Um, I'm just going to touch on two of the, of the components um, of Kennedy's message to Congress. It says, second, we must strengthen the underlying resources of knowledge and above all of skilled manpower which are necessary to mount and sustain our attack on mental disability for many years to come. Personnel from many of the same professions serve both the mentally ill and the intellectually disabled, and we must increase our existing training programs and launch new ones for our efforts cannot succeed unless we increase by sevenfold in the next decade the number of professional and subprofessional personnel who work in these fields. So even at the very beginning, at the inception of our movement, there's the recognition of the importance and of the quality of the, the people that carry out the, the, the work of this movement. And uh, as we all know, and as a result of Governor Wolf's comments, it's an issue that, you know, that we, we really struggle with and you know, have, uh, you know, have not been successful in honoring uh, this initial commitment. 
Then third, we must strengthen uh, and improve the program and facilities serving mentally ill and the intellectually disabled. This emphasis should be upon timely, intensive diagnosis, treatment, training, and rehabilitation so that the mentally afflicted can be cured are their functions restored to the extent possible. Services to both the mentally ill and to the intellectually disabled must be community-based and provide a range of services to meet community needs. It is with these objectives in mind that I'm proposing a new approach to mental illness and to intellectual disability. And you can, this is very important, you cannot imagine how radical this is, that there is a vision, that there is an alternative to the institutional model and that people experiencing severe disabilities really can be active and participating members in the community. The message to Congress then was followed by legislation, which the short form is the Community Mental Health Centers Act. Uh, this act uh, provided some facilities funding for community mental health centers, but the most important part is it provided $2 million state planning grants. Uh, the, the funding was really very modest, and Kennedy ended up being assassinated soon after this act passed. So what brought Dr. Adelstein to have the act of 1966 in his drawer when Stan said, this is wrong, we have got to do something? Now Joe's obituary uh, indicates that he served on President Kennedy's advisory board on mental health. Now it appears that he probably was not a member of that original you know, 27 member panel but probably served in one of the subcommittees or one of the uh, subsequent advisory boards. It's a very good assumption that the vision presented by President Kennedy and Adelstein's experience on Kennedy's uh, advisory commission uh, had a huge impact on the vision that he developed as the commissioner uh, for mental health within Pennsylvania uh, and that would uh, in, uh, could account for his beginning to think about reform in Pennsylvania and what kind of legislation uh, would re be required for that reform. Now records indicate that while Dr. Adelstein served in his first term as commissioner of mental health under Governor Scranton in 1963, that Pennsylvania did in fact receive one of the $2 million state planning grants uh, that came out of the Kennedy administration. Now this grant then within Pennsylvania, there was a comprehensive mental health study commission that was appointed and the study commission worked for two years and involved the participation of over 3,500 people in Pennsylvania that participate in the political and the, the policy development process. Uh, this commission framed out the structure uh, that was the foundation then for the, the um, Mental Health and Intellectual Disability Act of 1966. And Dr. Adelstein is recognized as the individual that led this political process and was the actual architect of the structure uh, of the act. Now the Mental Health and Intellectual Disability Act passed the legislature here in Pennsylvania on October 20th of 1966. So the actual 50th anniversary was Thursday of last week. Uh, I'm just going to touch on the uh, statement of purpose of the act under section 201 general powers and duties of the department the department shall have the power and its duty shall be to assure within the state the availability and equitable provision of adequate mental health and intellectual disability services for all persons who need them regardless of religion race color national origin settlement residence or economic or social status uh, it's interesting to note that this language actually mirrors some of the language that was in president kenny's report to Congress. Um, the act then went on to talk about duties of the counties and established for the first time uh, really thoughtful commitment procedures and framed out what a whole community system would look like and how it would function. Now Mel Knowlton is also one of the giants of our community. Um, uh, it's kind of interesting to note that I mentioned that from 66 until the early 1970s there really was not um, a lot of evidence of a huge amount of implementation of the act, that there was a lot of getting ready in counties where you know, there were a couple community mental health centers that were funded under the, the federal program. But Mel Knowlton then 
was hired by the Department of Public Welfare in May of 1972 to begin the development of community-based services and intellectual disabilities for Pennsylvania that were envisioned in the act of 1966. Uh, before coming to Pennsylvania, Mel worked uh, for Dr. Wolfensberger at NCOR in Omaha, Nebraska, and was director of the residential services. Um, Mel is the person who really drove and was the architect of our ID services in Pennsylvania. Uh, and uh, President Kenny, of course, was followed by President Johnson, who initiated the Great Society in Medicaid uh, that also included begin to, began to make Medicaid funding available for Medicaid waivers and intellectual disability. So Mel played a huge role both in terms of the developed and the architect of the ID system, but also brought tens of billions of dollars to Pennsylvania uh, in Medicaid funding for, you know, for waiver programs. And this is the time at where implementation of the Act of 66 really, really began to take off. Uh, this simply shows um, what the, um, uh, the increase in resources looked like that our community began to receive as a part of this process. Uh, we all know that it's fine to have a vision uh, of change and you know, how things should be, but it takes people who are really willing to push to lead, uh, to do the hard work of creating change in order to, uh, to do this. And the resources are really critical to uh, be successful in you know, all of the, the kinds of things that you all are, of course, in, uh, involved with. So what have we learned in this process? Um, when Dr. Adelstein left his position uh, of commissioner for mental health and moved to the community mental health center, um, uh, I did, in fact, have a chance to work with him directly for almost two years on a daily basis uh, while still being employed uh, you know, at the Harrisburg State Hospital. Um, working with him was an, quite an extraordinary experience to see the competence, the, the compassion, um, you know, the, the manner in which that, you know, he interacted uh, with people, and particularly people that were vulnerable. One of the first people that left the Harrisburg State Hospital uh, and participated in this particular program was a young man whose name was Harry Warner. And Harry was about 23, was very tall, maybe 6'4". Um, we became fairly good friends, but so Harry would have seizures maybe several times a week. Uh, and I have vivid recollections um, of uh, being next to Dr. Adelstein on our knees on the floor helping Harry through his seizures. Uh, and seeing the manner in which you know, Dr. Adelstein responded to him, the gentleness, the dignity, uh, you know, the, um, uh, you know, the, the caring was a profound example uh, and really, I think, set the foundation for our services that have that, that very powerful caring and humanitarian component to them. When I decided to take the position of founding president of Keystone, Keystone had nothing. We, we didn't have an office, we had no employees, we didn't have a phone, we didn't have a typewriter. And Dr. Adelstein was one of the first people I told uh, you know, that I decided to take the position. And he somewhat reluctantly offered his closet uh, as my, our first office. <laughs> and you know, this, it was a closet, it was like eight by 10 feet, had no ventilation, no windows. And so um, for the first couple of months then, you know, my door was almost always open. When it was open, I could actually see Dr. Adelstein sitting in his office with his, uh, his back to me. Uh, and I, I, I think that modeling uh, and having that proximity is a kind of a very important part of uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the story. Um, I think as the, the architect of our system and as humanitarian, he really did lay this incredibly important vision and values and foundation for our system that you know, has endured for 50 years and is every bit as relevant today as it was then. Uh, Adelstein uh, eventually became a professor of psychiatry at Penn State Hershey, and we remained friends uh, through that whole time. And towards the end of his professional career, uh, he told me that he had concluded that healthcare and human services was fundamentally a spiritual endeavor. Uh, and I, I found that uh, you know, a very profound from someone you know, of his experience and, uh, you know, and, and brilliance. Um, I also
also think that we should embrace the, the sacrifice and the suffering experienced by Rosemary Kennedy because looking back at this history, um, I think that if she had not had those awful experiences, we probably would not be here today. You know, there's a, there's a series of events of people who, for whatever reason, decided to really step forward and start driving change. And uh, I think her life had uh, an incredibly important part in this story and setting the, uh, you know, this you know, incredible uh, uh, story into motion. One story that here it says the the green, uh, the big green bus, and uh, uh, while still uh, working at the state hospital, um, uh, I was expecting to get my draft notice for Vietnam and was able to get into the Air National Guard uh, uh, here in Pennsylvania and uh, uh, was selected to go into pilot training. So I took an 18-month leave of absence from the state hospital. And when I returned, uh, I was flying a huge airplane, a super constellation. And there was just the dawning of the notion of integration. And someone came up with the wild idea that the patients at the hospital should start spending more time in the community. And um, uh, someone had the grand idea that since I could fly airplanes, I should get a bus license. <laughs> and uh, so I did. It was no trouble getting a bus license. And they gave me a gigantic green bus that had Harrisburg State Hospital printed uh, on black on the side and started to take patients out into the community and there'd be 30, 35 people on the bus and we'd go down for day trips and sometimes just go out and drive around and would have an absolutely grand time. And um, on one of the trips, um, uh, I got stopped by a local police officer, you know, sirens and lights, the whole thing. And, and so I pulled over and he comes up alongside of the bus you know, big, wide-brimmed hat. And uh, the, the gentleman sitting behind me was a, a gentleman named Nat Knowles. And Nat was a giant of a man, probably 6'6". Six, six. And um, the police officer motioned for me to open the driver's window, which I did. And he looked at me and he said, what are you doing? And before I could answer, Nat Knowles leaned forward. And he said, we're just a bunch of mental patients out for a ride. <laughs> And, and I've been thinking about this. You know, this, this was the first step at integration. And literally, at that time, that's, that's what the community resource was in Pennsylvania, like, you know, big green bus, because there were, there were almost no programs, no alternatives. And the fact that we've come so far in this 50 years, uh, I, I think is uh, an incredible, uh, is remarkable and incredible testimony to you know, our leaders. Um, in closing, you know, Dr. Adelstein's example of professional caring, uh, his conclusion that health care and human services is fundamentally a spiritual endeavor, um, both cautions and affirms us in our work today. Uh, and kind of thinking about what this message is in you know, terms of what Dr. Adelstein's perspective may be, is that we should not overly systematize our human services and should absolutely preserve and celebrate the human aspect of uh, service offered from one person you know, to another based on personal knowledge and caring. We should remember the architect of our system on his knees helping Harry Warner you know, through his seizures. We should sh really push back hard on systems complexity that really has an adverse impact on our ability to help people to have everyday lives. And we must understand that vision, values, and leadership really do matter and that they must be cultivated uh, and nurtured on an ongoing basis. We need people willing to say, Joe, this is wrong. We've got to do something. And we must understand that people's lives are messy, complex, unpredictable, and ever-changing. And our system must be able to accommodate this essential reality uh, as part of the human experience. And many of our members of the community will need supports uh, for the entirety of their lives. And they and their families are absolutely entitled to know that they're going to be secure. And whether
whether you're a Jew, Christian, Muslim, humanist, or atheist, it's important to understand that our work uh, really encompasses the essential aspect of what it means to be human and what our ultimate obligation is to each other. You, all of you here today are engaged on these issues on a day-to-day -day basis, and you should have a powerful voice and should really should be at the table as our society decides what kind of society we want for the future direct support professionals that do our work uh, of this community who really tend to the daily needs of living, really determine the quality and richness of life of the members of our community. And we've really failed mightily over this period in terms of providing an act adequate human resource model, living wage you know, for you know, the gifts and the time you know, that you all offer. And we are all part of absolutely a phenomenal global movement that on a daily basis really engages in these issues and works to really assure the basic human rights of people with disabilities. Uh, and that all of you have an incredibly important role to play in that regard. Uh, uh, the knowledge and experience that you all, or that the world is desperate for as more and more countries begin you know, to confront the human rights issues around this story. 